When I think of my mother dying at 60, and I think of my father's dying at 67, and here am I, 82, and why, why is God making me live so long? I think, why? Is there something for me to do? Is there something for me to, to make or do or find? I'm trying to find out why. Frank died when he was 64 years old and we were married for 39 years. He was very humble. He was very true in what he said. He was honest. He was very respectful. I felt secure with him. Like, you know, he was my, well, he was like my knight in shining armor. <laughs> he was good to me. He was really good to me. 2001, and I was looking for a one floor house because I felt I wanted to get on one floor because I fractured one knee and I had a bad knee on the other knee. And I lived there for 52 years. And I know I couldn't take too many steps. So I was cleaning out my cupboard with the intentions of cleaning out, knowing that I wanted to sell. And I came across my husband's letters from World War II. I looked at the box and I said, gee, this is too many to look at. I'll bring them downstairs. And I started putting them in year order. And I took one batch at a time. And it took me a whole week to read those letters. I lost 10 pounds because in reading his letters, it seemed to have brought his image back to life to me. And I could feel his letters were like love letters. I could feel the warmth of them coming out of the letters. And it just fascinated me. And I, I just, I, I couldn't eat. And this, this is the first letter, September the 2nd, 1942. This is my first batch of letters. Dear Jenny, I must write in a hurry. I miss you already. Please don't write to me yet. Say hello to your family for me. Yours, Frankie. That was his first part postcard he mailed me. September the 3rd, 1942. And that was the beginning of his letters that he sent. He was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. He's in Nashville, Tennessee. Pine Camp, New York. He is Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. He was getting ready to go overseas. APO 255, and he's in Germany. He's ready to fight the Germans. He writes me V-mail, and your V-mail is a small letter that they photograph. It's cold out here, honey, and believe me, it's hard to hold a pen. The ink in my bottle is solid ice. What a life without a wife. I hope I receive some mail tonight. Well, honey, take care of things. I miss you very much, and, and I hope you do too. Again, I close for a while. Love and kisses, your Frankie. He was not a real romantic guy, but in his letters, he, he tells me of his inner feelings. Dear darling Jenny, oh my darling, how my heart aches for you this morning. I feel so lonesome now. I want to cry, but I know it's not right for a boy to cry. All day, I felt as if my heart was being torn apart. Honey, that was a swell kiss you gave me at the station. I felt like shouting, she's my girl. Then I think of being away from you and not having your warm body against mine when I kiss you. Here's a kiss sealed under here for you. Send me one, okay? I don't know how long I can bear being away like I am. If something don't happen soon, I know I'll go nuts. Last night I dreamt of you. See how much you're on my mind? <laughs> and I sent him my graduation picture. He says, I know you want to know what I think of it. Well, honestly, Jenny, I can't even say. You're so darn pretty. I just can't believe you're the same girl I left behind 30 months ago. Of all the pictures I've ever received of you, 
This one is the loveliest. I can never say how much it means to me. Just from looking at this beautiful girl in this picture, I can't help but see just what a fellow like me wants in a wife. This is his last set of letters before the day he uh, left on the boat to come back home to Pittsburgh. My darling Jenny, today the war in Japan has officially ended. What a day this must be in America. According to the Stars and Stripes, five million men may be discharged. That means that I too may get to be a civilian again. So honey, if you want, you can get things started so we can get married and I'll be a one happy fella knowing that you're my very own. When I lay here on my cot, I keep thinking how we'll get along together when we're together for good. It won't be long now. Give my love to everybody and here's a kiss for my Jenny. With all my love, I'm your Frankie. Ego amo too, and he sends kisses and hugs. When I first met him, I was doing my night work in high school. And he asked me what I was doing, and I told him I was doing my Latin. He said, well, write something. So I wrote Ego Amo too, because kids, you always find little things to, how to learn how to write in, English, in uh, Latin. So he read it. He says, what does this mean? And I told him, it says, I love you. Well, he kept it in his pocket, and I still have that piece of paper today after 65 years. That's his rose I kept from his funeral. Yeah. These are hankies that he, he sent me. This is from, uh, from Belgium. Here it is. This is from Paris, 1945. Mm -hmm. And it says, To my sword, love reckons ours for months and days, for years, and every little absence is an age. He was fighting a war, and all he was seeing was blood, you know, war, living out in the, living out in the woods. In three three years, he lived out in in the air. They would hear these buzz bombs coming through, and then they don't know where they were going to be hitting at. And I I felt so bad. Like, what could you do for him? So I had to give him something to get him through that period. So that the only thing I could give him was my letters. My letters kept him alive, and I try to make him happy in my letters. A friend of his had gone to the Navy. It was in 1943. And when I got the, the letters from Frank, in the letter, I had opened it up. This was in 2001. And I saw Phil's picture. And I'm thinking, I wonder if he's still living. I said, out of curiosity, I'm going to go in the telephone book and I'm going to look up and see if I can find his name. And I figured, well, there's two Phil's. I said, I'm, I'm going to try the first name. I says, this is Frank Caputo's wife, and I'm finding out if he's still around. And he told me, yes, he's still living. So he gave me his phone number, and he says, why don't you call? I think he'd like to hear from you. I said, okay. So I dialed the number, and it was an answering machine. I says, please call my number. So I gave him my number. So about must have been about 8.30 that night, a phone rang, and here it was Phil. I says, how would you like to come down for and a, an Italian dinner. It was May 14th, 2001. He came down for dinner, and that was the first time I seen him since he came to see me in 1943. 
And I couldn't get over her. I said, gee, you look great. His wife had passed away about 37 years ago, and he's been a widower himself. He's the same type of a person as Frank was, you know. They're almost like two peas in a pod. Very, very bashful, very shy. He remembers me as a young girl. And he knows all my family, my mother, my dad. He knows my sisters, my brothers. He comes to spend the day with me. And I always make sure I have some kind of dessert for him. And I swear the time goes fast. He can come here about 1.30 in the afternoon. He don't leave till about seven o'clock at night. And the time just flies. He respects women. That's what I like about him. He respects a woman and what she has to do in the kitchen. And he, he feels so, he thanks me for the meal. He can't get over that I cook. I'm a baker's daughter, right. My dad would make the dough. And every Friday we would have pizza. And she would get the dough and put them on the tray. And being it was Friday, we couldn't have no meat, so she would put anchovies in there. And she would put the tomato sauce and a Romano cheese, whatever went on there. I don't buy pizza. I make anything, cream puffs, I make biscottis, cookies, chocolate chip cookies, oat milk cookies, pies. Last week I made whoopie cakes and macaroons. And to me, it's nothing, you know, it's just making something for my family. Whatever you want, I make. I'm not afraid to tackle anything. I, I spend days by myself, really, and I do a lot of reading because I have nothing else to do, nobody to talk to. I, in fact, I don't watch television during the day. I listen to radio during the day. And um, when I'm with him, we watch maybe TV, or he loves to listen to Frank Sinatra on, on my records. He is in good shape. He don't take no pills. You know, he takes a baby aspirin. Like, he's going to be 88. Now, that's, that's two years less than 90. <laughs> It's a different type of love. It's like I say, it's more like say like a companionship. Somebody you can relate to because you both came from the same place. He'll sit here and say, I can't believe that I'm sitting next to Frankie's wife. <laughs> Is there something for me to do? Is there something for me to, to make or do or find? I'm trying to find out why. Maybe it was to meet Phil and to have a nice companion for him to spend time with me, you know. And I think maybe that's what I'm living for, and I'm 82. Someone that I can talk to, you know.